it here it is so hey hello everybody back there um this is the last conference of the week actually my students for the workshop of intelligent fabrication will continue for another week and we hope that they will have brilliant results but as we had the chance also for the students and also for other people to check into some of these conferences to talk about whether it be intelligent fabrication or at least also what we are researching with my colleague Stéphane Berthier on experience and experimentation. How does it help on the level of uh, real building? What do you do with that? How can you actually bring the material back to the table as a, as a point of discussion in general conception of architecture? and to bring people back together between architects, engineers, and the manufacturing world. I think that those are some of the topics where we were talking about and we are looking at, of course, because it, is it a new paradigm? Is it something we should teach differently in schools? How can we teach it differently? And I think the last speaker of today, so Oliver, um, I'm gonna blend in the presentation. I, I'm not sure I have seen your colleague, Matthew. Oh yeah, Matt, no, he's not, he's not joining. He's got a horrible deadline, so he's, he's stepped back, but we're, we're quite interchangeable. We've talked about this work a lot, so it's just me today. Yeah. Okay, so I'm still gonna introduce you, Oliver. Yeah. So we've known each other since a bit now, since uh, the teaching in the Bartlett, and I've been overwhelmed by your last lecture I saw uh, on this topic. So I, I am very proud actually to invite you for this series. And I hope there's gonna be tons of discussion after this thing, especially between and with the students and between professionals actually too. So I've seen that a couple of my colleagues also came into the room to check this one. And I think it's really, really massively interesting in the, late, in the light of the, of the developments that we're going through today, especially also the status of architecture, the status of conception of architecture and engineering. And so uh, Oliver is uh, the director of technology and a lecturer in environmental design at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL. And he's uh, responsible for working with colleagues in developing, augmenting, and leading the school strategy for technology and architecture. So this is where I met, of course. I mean, I'm teaching in the triple degree um, MNG program at the Bartlett. So for those that are interested, of course, this is fantastic studies. It's very experimental. And uh, Oliver has been very helpful in, uh, in our development. So his research and teaching on environmental design of diverse matters include inhabitation, material technology, environmental and energy performance, and developing new forms of construction. Oliver is also a director of the architectural practice WW Studio and has over 20 years of experience working as an architect and environmental design consultant with involvement on a range of innovative and award-winning build projects. I have to pass you the greetings also of somebody we're working with from the architectural practice SCO. Um, he studied with you, I think, so I should pass you greetings. I'll, I'll talk about that later, but <laughs> I'm lo looking much forward to your uh, lecture. So I'm going to pass you the reins and uh, leave you the stage. Great, thanks. Thanks, that was a very kind, that was a very kind introduction. And um... And I did, I read the information you sent over um, about the this session you're currently, you guys are currently involved in. And yeah, I do think, I think this will, this work will fit pretty well into that just naturally, really. Um, so I'll get on with the talk and then let's leave some time later for, um, for discussion on it. Right. So, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about some work I did uh, with Matthew Barnett Howland and some other colleagues. Um, working with cork and talks called cork fabrication and habitation which is really just linking some of the work we did on prototyping cork to some broader issues of inhabitation and the role of role of architects in practice sort of thing All right let's see if i can get this to work okay just, so there's I've, i added a little bit on the history in here just for five minutes which um i think leads quite quite well into the work so i'm going to get on with that Now, I just need to adjust my screen. Okay. So Cork, 
corks the outer bark of the cork oak tree. Uh, bark's an, a non-technical term for the outer layers of the tree. Um, uh, you can see a section through a tree trunk here. And the bit we're interested in is C, which is the outer bark. And that's that's dead, dead matter, a bit like um, fingernails or hair, if you like, in people. So it's there. It, it helps to keep the rain out. It helps to protect the tree against in, insect attack. Uh, it's harvested around every nine years using hand tools in a process that doesn't harm the tree. Uh, the trees themselves can live um, around for about 200 years. And as you can see, a mature tree, uh, as the one photographed here, can yield a lot of cork. Cork oak landscapes have existed around the Mediterranean basin for thousands of years. And uh, cork oaks typically grow in areas with low rainfall. And the, in, in doing so, they help to stabilize the hydrology in these areas, which helps to support eco, lo, local ecosystems and also helps to present desertification. Currently mainly distributed in Portugal, Spain and North Africa, as you can see on this map. And this, the cork oak landscape support a gentle form of agroforestry, um, practiced in well-managed cork oak landscapes. And this helps to support a, a broad biodiversity of, of uh, plants and animals. So you can see here the Eurasian crane and the Iberian lynx. Now, there's a long history of building with cork in the region going back thousands of years. And the most frequently cited historical account is contained in Pliny the Elder's Natural History, written um, 23 to 79 AD. Uh, this records many uses for cork, including winter shoes and roof coverings. And you can see here um, cork planked roofs uh, pictured in Duarte de Armas, 16th century manuscript, The Book of Fortresses, where he illustrates them on a number of uh, Portuguese settlements. So you can see here really where cork trees were available. People just stripped the cork and used it in a very laissez-faire way, just stuck the sheets on roofs, things like that. Here are some photographs of uh, um, more recently taken where corks, corks been chopped up into blocks and literally, literally substituted for stone or brick in a masonry wall construction. Um, using lime mortar. And again, this is quite widespread in, uh, in Portugal, for example, where these photographs were taken. Although it's not very widely documented because it's, it's a kind of low form of architecture. Um, another historic use, 16th century uh, convent of the Capuchos in Sintra, Portugal. Uh, corks used in a more targeted and, uh, way, um, including for a sort of aesthetic and decorative uses. So you can see cork, uh, a cork sheet on the door here which helps to keep it warm. And the interior, you can see uh, cork linings used in relation to religious iconography and for decorative uses on the ceiling. And also just to make it a bit more comfortable to live in. So moving on quickly to a more modern use of cork. So in his 1665 book, Micrography, sorry, Micrographia, Robert Hooke observed that um, our microscope will inform us that the substance of cork is altogether filled with air and the air is perfectly enclosed in little boxes or cells distinct from one another. Now, this is, um, this is a drawing he produced of what he saw when he looked through his microscope. And interestingly, this is the first time that the word cell has been used to describe biological matter. And it, that was in relation to cork. So this sort of um, scientific interest in cork it really underlies our current understanding of it and and uses so um it's a closed cell foam it's less than 20 percent solid by volume it's composed of around half subarin which is a waxy resin plus other substances including lignin and cellulose so as a result it's thermally insulative it's relatively hydrophobic and impermeable to water it's elastic it's relatively inert and surprisingly resilient and it does have some capacity to take take loads cork wine stoppers have been uh, for some time, the core financial driver for farming cork and sustaining these landscapes. And the finest cork is still reserved for these purposes. And you can see here, the fine cork stoppers are literally just cut out of a, of a cork strip. That leaves a great deal of cork byproduct, um, which then becomes available for other uses. And it's this cork that's mainly used to build with. Some of it's simply granulated and used in that form, for example, as lucifer insulation. Um, and the, the, the cork we're interested in is, um, is called um, agglomerated P2 
pure cork board, and that was invented in the 19th century at a time when there was a great deal of industrial innovation around use of cork. Um, now, this is where cork's granulated and cooked um, in autoclaves, and the subarin melts and then rebonds to form a 100% pure plant based block with no added plastics or anything like that. Yeah. So these innovative uh, cork manufacture resulted in these industrially produced cork products, which, which was just what the modern architects, the pioneering modern architects of the time, were looking for to augment the, the geological materials that, um, that they mainly use, steel, concrete, that sort of thing. So you can see here in, uh, in Stuttgart in 1927, uh, Walter Gropius, house number 17, uh, used an early form of prefabrication the steel frame cork infill blocks which were then overclad with cementitious board so a really interesting system and a really unremarkable looking result um alvar alto used cork extensively in his architecture um the Pymio sanatorium here used cork as a thermal insulation board which was which was cast into the formwork with the concrete and extensively for internal floor finishes and acoustic insulation um the US was one of the major manufacturers of cork products. They imported the cork from Europe um, and it's used, it's been used extensively there, including on a number of Frank Lloyd Wright projects. So you can see here he's used um, he's used waxed cork on the floor and unwaxed cork on the walls in this bathroom. And that was at the request of the client here in Falling Water to soften it a little bit because he initially intended to just use stone slabs everywhere. Um, it's also been it's it's also been extensively used in retrofit projects for a long time. Yeah? So here in 1959, the workmen are installing cork in, in the White House during a major remodel with President Truman looking on. Um, and as, as the second half of the 20th century proceeded, uh, cork products were partly displaced by plastic products. So cork is the original um, foam insulation board. And second of the 20th century saw it largely displaced by petrochemical plastic foams, which are cheaper and more uh, and give a higher thermal performance. But at the same time, cork remains a very attractive material to use, uh, being a plant based material with strong environmental sustainability profile and also an unusual combination of characteristics. Um, so here you can see the first um, external cladding use for this expanded cork board. Uh, 20 years ago in Hanover Expo 2000 Pavilion, uh, which has now been moved to Portugal, where this photograph was taken. And that was by Alvaro Cesar and Eduardo Sutatamora. And here's another uh, distinctive uh, use that recognized the phenomenological character. Um, Herxel and Demara on in the uh, 2012 Serpentine Pavilion, where they're using a plastic bound foam uh, cork, cork product. Right, so this is how the, the cork board that we used uh, gets made. And this is a photograph taken at, the, um, at a factory of the project partner Amrim, who was one of the research partners. So they get a load of waste cork. There's a massive pile here, which actually goes on for about a kilometer or, or half anyway. Um, that's then granulated up and placed into autoclaves where it's cooked under superheated steam under pressure and cork then expands and you get these huge cork buns which you can see on the right coming out with a crust of subarin um, which are then left to dry and stabilize for about a month and this then now takes us to uh, the research that we've done on this that led to the cork house which i understood with Martin, matthew barnett howland and, and several other partners photograph the cork house so when we undertook this work, we had a particular life cycle interest. Uh, and so we're going to describe the, the work in those terms, starting off with the design strategy and related to construction research. So contemporary buildings need to meet a range of performance requirements. And this is typically done by adopting an accretive approach to construction, starting with structure, adding a layer to, give, to meet the insulation requirements, adding vapor control and breather membranes quite often, um, and then adding external framing and cladding and, and internal finishes. 
And this creates a, a, a complex building envelope consisting of multiple components and assemblies, which is um, inherently complex. So to put this in context, until around 100 years ago, a brick wall uh, was typically just that. It was a wall made up of brake clay bricks bonded by, by lime mortar. And this simple form of construction was used extensively in, in huge amounts of housing in London and elsewhere in the UK, where the brick wall you see it from the outside is, is the same thing that's carrying the load from the floors and the roof. So nowadays, a brick building is typically utilized a non-structural facing brick to give the an external appearance of, of a brick wall, along with a multitude of different materials, building products, and specialist subsystems. This complex assembly results from a piecemeal historical evolution in relation to shifting uh, demands and performance requirements. And very often, as requirements are changed, the answer has simply been to add another component. And this type of construction builds in complexity at every stage of the building life cycle, from resource to design, assembly, in use, uh, and, and in use performance. And, um, and its consequences are perhaps most apparent at the end of building life, where, where quite often um, you get destructive demolition because it's, it's too expensive to disassemble the building because of its diversity of parts and the way it's been put together. So the aim of our research was to replace the complexity of all these separate layers with, guess what, expanded cork. Yeah. So thermal insulation is a, its main use currently. Um, load bearing structure is not how it's normally used. Yeah? And it's, it's relatively good at, at handling uh, moisture transfer. So this gave us a hypothesis for our research project. And that was that we could replace the current complex layered model of the building envelope with a solid court building envelope that, that would be able to meet all current building performance requirements in the UK. So with this, uh, with this, with the aim of testing this hypothesis, uh, we um, then assembled a, a team of collaborators to undertake this research in detail. So that was Matthew Barnett Hall and myself working with uh, Arup on structures and, and fire engineering, AMRIM on material supply and performance, uh, University of Bath for structural characterization, and TMAR, an expert in, in market issues related to sustainable building products. And that work was partly funded by EPSRC and Innovate UK. So th the research consisted of um, two main strands, really. One was building, um, building prototype buildings, on the left, you can see the cork casket, which is the first small thing we built in 2014. And on the right, the cabin, which was built in 2017. And that was combined with a load of detailed lab testing, which was required to get sufficient characterization of the material and the assemblies so that they could be designed to meet current uh, building requirements. So the, what you can see here is the, um, some of the structural testing that was undertaken by Professor Pete Walker and his team at University of Bath, starting with uh, structural characterization of blocks of the material on the left, and then moving through to uh, testing of uh, full assembly. So here you can see on the right, the wall assembly being tested for lateral loading with a big, with a big inflatable pillow. And this is the data that the Arab then used to, um, when they're undertaking the structural design. Uh, we took a similar approach with fire, um, with uh, extensive test being undertaken at BRE to give a classification for the cork roof structure we designed. And this characterization was then used by Arup when designing uh, the fire strategy for cork house to make sure it was compliant with UK regulations and safe. So another unknown was with cork was, would it really keep, keep the rain out? And so we did a range of wind-driven, uh, range of wind-driven rain testing at BRE using a large wind tunnel and a load of spray nozzles, and so that sprays water onto a onto an assembly, which you can see in the middle there. And there's a massive vacuum cleaner underneath, basically, that tries to suck suck uh, rainwater through and see if it can get the structure to leak. Now the wall assembly performed very well. We were pleased. They couldn't get any water to pass through it. And initially the roof assembly, which was just bare cork, leaked 
it tr the water trickled down under gravity. And so back to the drawing board and we developed the system and added um, some cedar, cedar weatherboarding, um, which you can see here. And second time around, it passed okay. So we were sort of really getting rolling at that point. Now the weatherboarding, it, the, the cabin that you can see on the left there also leaked after a few months. And when we added this weatherboarding system uh, to the cabin that also worked well. We used the cabin for a range of in situ tests. Um, we just wanted to, you know, see how it do for, for a year on site. And we also undertook a range of specific tests. So what you can see here is um, uh, some, some thermal and humidity modeling, uh, monitoring over 12 months <clears throat> on the left. And on the right, we're undertaking a standard air, air tightness test. Uh, where this guy came with a huge fan and and saw how much air he could suck into or push out of the cabin through the through the fabric, and we were um, yeah we were really pleased when it passed the UK requirement first time round because we weren't sure about that. Um, what what you can see on the left here is a thermal imaging camera taken when the air is being cold air from outside is being sucked into the house, looking up at, at the roof. And the darker patches show where it, where there's leakage occurring. So what that shows is there's a level of air leakage occurring through the through the dry joints in the system. Yeah. And we were aware that this would be an issue. And to help reduce that, after the cabin had been assembled, we added these removable foam strips, which are one centimeter deep, that you can see on the right hand side. They're just slotted into recessed joints, which just help to reduce air leakage into the cabin. So at the end of the this uh, lab based research and prototyping what we did, we felt that the, the system was de risked enough to take it to its first live architecture project, which was Cork House. Right, moving on to fabrication now. So taking the expanded cork billets on the left, we set out to develop a simple prefabricated construction kit that's assembled by hand on site. So something a little bit like giant plant-based Lego. So this is really very important in relation to what you guys are doing at the moment. Um, so Matthew and I, um, we met when we started teaching together, making workshops about, I don't know, a long time ago now, 20 years ago. We both really enjoy uh, hands-on experience with materials as a way to really understand what their, what their potential is. So initially we started in the workshop with simple tools. So just hand saws um, and working with a colleague here, Bim Burton, just using traditional machine tools, just start playing with the material and producing simple parts and assemblies. Um, and have, you know, simple hypotheses. So this is fun because this was really exactly the sort of thing I would have been doing when I was a student too. But obviously because we had uh, better resources available under this funded research project, we could take it a lot further. Um, so you can see here, we just started mocking up simple wall and roof assemblies. Initially we started using uh, timber profiles. Um, you can see on the left there to actually lock the blocks in place that they're quite light. We thought they might just blow away. Um, and this this has the this has the advantage of of needing minimal cork uh, milling, so you're not having to cut much of the cork block away. Yeah. Um, here's some other early work we did, just looking at how the, the 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 interlock profiles could also act as weather bars to help limit rainwater ingress. So we're just working on some quite loose hypotheses at this time, and we then moved on, and um, we were quickly able to to produce our first prototype, which is this very small cork casket. Here you can see it was prefabricated at the Bartlett. Then we shipped it to site and, and put it together. And it was great fun to do that, but we could see that by adding some of these parts in, it, um, the timber dowels, this actually had lime mortar to hold the blocks together. We were actually building in complexity and some issues. So we then moved back to just using pure cork blocks. And we started trying to work with the inherent character of the cork, it's kind of sponginess. Um, and we both quite like a glass of wine. So we're thinking about the way that wine corks squeeze into the bottle um, and started working with that principle. So you could sort of squeeze in and we thought that could that could give a nice air lock and, and keep, the, keep the rainwater out too. Uh, we moved away from that approach because 
we were very keen to keep the system disassemblable. And what was happening was that when you took the blocks apart, it was ripping part of the tongue off. So we moved away from that and instead uh, moved on to an interference fit, which is just a kind of snug fit, just like you get with a block of Lego, basically. Yeah. Um, and things were moving forward and going quite well. And um, But one thing we realized quite early on was that um, whilst there's a simplicity to asking one material to perform all of these various functions of the building envelope, um, the shape of the blocks themselves were starting to become quite complicated because um, we were asking asking a lot from them, and this prevented this presented challenges um, with the manual fabric fabrication system we're using. So it, you can see on the right hand side the roof block geometry is quite geometry was quite complicated to manually fabricate, and issues there were it was starting to take quite a lot of time to make each block, and also it was really challenging to get sufficiently low tolerances, tight tolerances, to get that interference fit that we needed um, for air tightness and other things, which is we're looking at um, no more than plus minus one millimeter on the cutting. So um, so we're lucky to be based at the Bartlett, where we have colleagues who know a lot about CNC fabrication, including robotics. And so we then work with BMADE to develop a robotic fabrication system uh, for, the, for the blocks. And that's what we used for the rest of the research project. Um, so yes, in terms of the architect role, you can see we're, we're slightly working in an expanded role here in a way that we greatly enjoyed. So here we um, we contributed, you know, we, we designed the manufacturing system basically for the blocks. Um, and we had a, a, a large industrial robot without a tool changer. So there was a benefit to using a single cutter for the whole thing because changing cutters midway would have introduced uh, additional time and also could have introduced tolerance issues. So we re reshaped the, the block geometry to enable it to be cut, all the blocks to be cut by this large cutter here. So you can see uh, on the left, the vacuum bed that held the blocks in place, in the middle, the large cutter, and on the right, the way that it can cut face on large volumes of cork, and then edge on slots relating to things like um, rainwater drainage, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, so this is the method we used. We in um, we used Pro Engineer, and um, I think it was Delcam to uh, as part of the digital workflow to generate the G code. And we also tried just using Grasshopper and a, a bespoke script in Grasshopper and Rhino just to see what would what would work best. Um, and it took quite a lot of toing and froing. Tolerance, getting tolerances right was a big challenge on this. But when it did work, in the end, it worked very well. And here's a here's a short video of a roof block being being milled. So as you can see, in the end, it worked very well. And that's one of the more complex uh, roof blocks. And we got the time down to about 50 minutes per block for those in, in the end, after a lot of toing and throwing and, and hard work, mainly from Matthew. Um, and it, it was very successful in, in the court cabin project. But uh, um, we're, we, you know, we're not particularly CNC focused, Matthew and I, and we had imagined it would be a very sort of clean and relatively effortless process, but there was a lot of work in developing this method. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't that clean either, as, as Matthew found to his cost. This is how he looked every day for about six months where we were trying to get that to work. <laughs> really tired and covered in this cork dust. So the, so the cutting produces loads of dust and it's statically charred, charged and it just sticks everywhere. So after they moved the robot to another site, they were still finding bits of cork dust stuck, stuck to it. But um, yeah, that was, that was an interesting aspect. Um, but anyway, the point is, we, you know, it did in the end uh, 
proved to be a very effective way to proceed. And the point at which we really felt it was going to work was when we assembled this first uh, this first wall, and it all seemed to be moving forward very well. Um, and that that method that we the fabrication method that we used we didn't we didn't use the robot for the cork house which the, the cabin had about two hundred blocks the house had over a thousand and I'm not sure Matthew would have survived if he'd had to cut all of the house blocks there so we 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 worked with uh, CNC fabricator Wop Doodle who had this huge beast of a five axis CNC machine and they cut um, the um, over a thousand blocks for the for the house uh, out in Surrey. Uh, sorry, I didn't suffer. Now they did. Um, they did very much take the method we developed on and develop it for, for their machine. So they used a vacuum bed again, which you can see on the left. They had a fancy tool changer, so they weren't uh, restricted to just one tool, and they used a range of tools to cut the blocks. Um, here's the machine in action, and it produced, you know, several dozen, dozen different block types. So you can see on the left here at the bottom a standard wall block corner wall block in the middle and a roof block on the top and this is a, these blocks were a development of those developed during the research project um, and there you can see um, some of the assembly happening on site so it's caught blocks in in combination with uh, with uh, prefabricated timber components um, so as you probably noticed, we we got quite a lot of cork granules and dust, cork byproduct from the from the fabrication process, particularly for the roof blocks, where we cut quite a lot of the block away, up to about twenty percent. And as part of the research project, um, our project partners looked at uses for this byproduct. So on the left, we've got a cork lime terrazzo produced by T Mauer, which they I think they cast as a floor in one of their um, outbuildings. And on the right. Um, these are cork fuel briquettes produced using a standard briquette maker, uh, which Wop Doodle, the CNC fabricator, I think they're still heating their heating their battery space with those today. So moving on to assembly. Um, so really, when it, when it came to construction, the objective uh, was to develop a simple assembly process to complement the material simplicity of the design. Um, and this in this is sorry. In this respect, we were interested in, uh, in thinking about cork in a similar way to um, the way you think about stone as a building material, working with it mainly in compression, um, cut to shape. Cork's obviously a lot weaker than stone, and it's also usefully a lot more thermally insulative. So yeah, the, you know, the insulative character made us think about cork as a possible substitute for stone. Uh, um, and then it enabled us to draw on the history of, uh, of masonry architecture, basically, uh, to inform the project. Um, so the, the brick houses um, we looked at earlier, and also a range of historic structures from around the world. And, and when it came to considering the roof structure, we were keen to keep the form of construction simple. So rather than introduce a different type of roof, uh, we used a corbelled roof structure, which is basically just a wall uh, where you just start offsetting the blocks a little bit to give you a roof enclosure. So you can see, uh, see that in the images on the left. And um, using that, this approach, we developed the cork construction kit, which is what we used for the cork house. So it combines cork blocks with prefabricated timber components. Um, every piece was bespoke and uh, in general, drawn by Matthew, sent off to workshops in UK and Europe, and then returned to site directly for assembly. So you can see on the left here, you can see the form of construction used in Cork House. So the foundations are steel screw piles. So the house doesn't use any cement or glue on site. And um, the foundations are screw piles, which are basically just giant screws that you screw into the ground and you can remove them at end of building life. Um, we used a coir timber, which is a kind of it's an acetylated timber, which which tends not to rot because we're uncertain about the level of humidity when we're using timber within the depth of the cork structure. So there's an acoya ring beam on top of which sits a CLT floor. Um, on top of that, cork wheels were built, timber ring beam with a couple of uh, structural CLT wardrobes to help with lateral load, then the cork cobbled roof. 
and some st steel roof lights sitting on top of that, which act as paperweights and help to weigh the structure down. So assembly on site was a relatively straightforward process. That each court block weighs around 13 kilograms, so it's quite easy for one or two people to handle, and there's no no wet trades involved. So it's simply a matter of putting one block on top of another. And you can see here um, when it worked, the, the what the high precision fabrication gave us. Uh, this is the kind of keystone block, if you like, on the core walls, and it just slotted into place and um, beautifully and gave a completed course. And it wasn't, there were some tolerance issues. It didn't always go as smoothly as that. Um, here's somebody, here's a BBC report of building a wall to give you an idea of how simple it can be. Now I've been told even an idiot such as me can have a go at uh, doing a bit of construction. So let's see if this really is idiot proof. And oh, it really is like, uh, Building blocks. This is, I think, the roof. And there we go. In. Oh. And there. I think I've just built a wall. Not brilliant, but that was about a minute, wasn't it? Amazing. Right, okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about use and a bit more detail about the house. And I'll be fairly brief on that because I don't think it's really the focus of, of the session today. So the house is located on a small island uh, in the River Thames called Tangier Island at the edge of um, a town called Eton. The village, it's a village really, it's pretty tiny. So you can see the cork house here building called Eton College to the north there. Um, so the, the chapel is a load bearing structure um, built largely with solid stone and compression in some ways quite similar to Cork House. And it was one of the projects that informed the design of this house. Here you can see them together. The, the site for the Cork House was an awkward site um, between two gardens. And these spaces were left over from on the right hand side, there's a Thames water um, infrastructure site and these gardens are just the leftover bit from that site basically so the house acts as a as a to resolve the relationship between those two gardens and it includes a, includes an open bay between the gardens that also acts as the entrance into the house here's a short film of the house in its context and you can see the water pumping station behind and to the back right you can see the main house See the main facade of the cork house and the way that it relate opens out onto its own garden. So here's the plan. You can see that th these cork walls are the main structure. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a cellular structure by nature, and we wanted it to be quite open plan inside. So you can see it is. And as a result of that, we introduced two structural CLT wardrobes to help take lateral loading so that the house wouldn't be blown down by the wind. Here's the section, which is a deliberately simple uh, model, just putting mainly to do with putting one block of cork on top of another. Um, long section shows the range of living spaces from bedroom on the right, living in the center, then bathroom, and then the open bay on the left as it relates to the, the river. And I'll just give a very brief tour of the house. So this is the view as you approach the house, moving into this open bay, which takes you through to the rear garden and also into the house. This is the uh, first time you can look up and, and understand the sort of primordial character of the, of the house. This is the view from the rear garden, um, steps down from the living area. So close up, it's quite a, it's quite an unusual, obviously quite an unusual form of construction, and it is, it does appear to be very stone-like, but at the same time, it's uh, oddly sort of warm and soft to the touch. Um, internally, 
it's quite a dark material so we needed to take care in designing it to bring plenty of daylight in to balance light and dark um, gives this smoky aroma and it's also quite acoustically absorbent so it's a very sort of calm environment and you can see that the, there's a relatively light oak floor which helps to increase light and also give a bit more liveness to the acoustic so don't feel as though you're in a padded cell uh, another photograph of same space um, the bedroom end bay and the view that you get when you're going to sleep at night that's really nice you can really feel the the compressive load coming down around you it feels very sheltering and at night you can see the stars through the roof light which is really nice so in terms of the interior fit out we're we're keen to keep on with the same approach um and so we use plant-based materials wherever possible so it's mainly uh, timber so this is recycled clt um, for the furniture and there are a number of other timber products um, and adding to that we yeah so externally there was uh, cedar cladding added and we used copper copper rainwater goods uh, which should life last the life of the building and simple to um, return to the manufacturing chain afterwards and internally on wet surfaces we used um, unlacquered solid brass and here you too, you can see we the interior has got a sprinkler system, so we didn't have to treat the cork, and that's exposed cop copper piping. And a bit of fun in the bathroom um, to offset the slightly maybe perhaps a slightly serious tone of the rest of the house, architectural tone, a bit more illusion, and and a bit of fun. Right. So moving on to the last few slides. Um, so every every building gets to the point where it reaches the end of its life. Um, and as already mentioned, to avoid this kind of uh, destructive demolition, we carefully designed the system so that it can be taken apart as easily as it can be put together. Now we tested that um, in the research stage when we when we built the court cabin at the Bartlett. You can see we built the walls and then the roof. This was to make sure it fitted together properly before we took it to site. And then we disassembled it in the middle transport site for assembly. And that that worked very well. And the rest of the house, um, where it wasn't just an interference fit, we used mechanical fittings, so screws and things like that, that are easily removable, so that the whole house should be simple to disassemble at the end of its life, whenever, whenever that is. It, it's designed for, for long life, um, but should also be easy to disassemble. Right, just finish off now. So just, this is just to summarize the, the cork house life cycle. So we've used a material that comes from a biodiverse landscape on the top left. Um, the pure expanded cork that we've used here is made by using waste cork from forestry and industry. It, it's cooked into blocks in Amarim's plant uh, using mostly um, heat generally generated mostly from waste biomass. Um, we use CNC fabrication uh, to prefabricate the blocks for easily asse easy assembly on site, so we didn't use to need to use any glues or mortars. On the bottom left, you can see the architecture has a distinctive character that relates to this life cycle approach. And at the end of building life, uh, it should be simple to simply disassemble to use the cork blocks, or they could be granulated, returned into the manufacturing chain for use as loose fill insulation. And at the point where they fall out of the human use cycle, because they haven't been treated, there are no contaminants, it should just be possible to return them to the earth so that they generate new growth. So thank you. That's the end of the talk. Just to acknowledge partners here, this was this was a research and architecture project that took about six years in total. And um, project partners listed here played a, played a key role. So thanks very much. Oh, uh, again, I'm, I'm amazed how it entirely worked and also how you actually got it done also. So I'm still in awe, actually. It's, it's really nice. And it's very uh, nice also to see how you technically uh, explain it. So you go into all the details and you did do a lot of testing before, like each time, each singular step had to be tested before there could really be an answer and going back to the drawing block. And I think that's really something very special uh, to this process. I'm not gonna ask, to, I, I see that there's a couple of questions. So if you if you don't mind, we can go through these. Um, yes, please, yeah. 
So there's one group that, that asks um, if the compact technique uh, impacts the property of the material. Is the, and a second question to that they add, is there an additive added to the cork block? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can ask, I can answer the first question first. Yeah. So, um, no, the cork blocks are just made by cooking cork. So that's the really amazing thing about them really, which made them so attractive for use in this project. When I found that out, then I got more excited about the project because I initially I'd assume they would be maybe, um, uh, bound by by plastics and actually the cork what you find when you um when you're walking on cork flooring or something like that that historically was cork with latex or sometimes it would be cork with bitumen for use in cow sheds and things like that it got all over the place but these days it's cork with polyurethane plastic binder which makes it much more resilient and um that that's still quite widely used that product but this was a particular interest because it's literally just cork granules cooked at about 250 degrees and the resin in them melts and then rebinds so it's 100 percent plant-based in terms of the character of the material um yeah i mean it's used it's normally used as an insulation product and so um and Amarim have uh, information about a kind of range of thermal performance and that sort of stuff. So it just isn't put to this sort of use normally. And it is almost a kind of semi-agricultural process where they make it. Uh, it's not very precisely controlled. So yeah, there are lots of variables that can affect the particular character of any of any block. Like how many how many granules they put into the into the autoclave, that's normally fairly controlled, but the size and shape of the granules, um, if it's if it's spread more down one side of the autoclave than the other, you get higher density on one side and low density on the other. So there's a lot of variability across the material, um, across the final blocks. Um, and that's before you start fabricating it. Um, uh, one of the things that was important to us that we didn't really realize before is um, for quite a while in the research is that there's about 15% void in each block. Yeah. Because the, it's a bit like a rice cake, if you know what a you know a rice cake is. This is basically just expanded um, granules of cork that glue to each other. And you do get voids in between. And in some cases, we were getting specific roof blocks leaking. And that was just where there was a kind of void labyrinth that just led easily through and let the water just trickle through. So yeah, there's quite a lot of variability on the material. Uh, that's one of the reasons... Um, for chopping it back too, it gets a kind of crust on it, a bit like a loaf of bread. So the initial thing was to cut it, Amarim cut it to size before they deliver it to you. And at that point, it's a fairly uniform material. But yeah. anyway. Uh, it means the autoclave, it's not standardized sizes of the block. It's something you order already up front. Like you want this size of block? Yeah. No, the autoclave is, they are standard. They have uh, different factories have different sizes so the the width and the length are standard and they can they can make different heights depending on how much cool, how much granule they put in and and how far down the, the the lid comes um and we did look with amarim at options for making different sorts of bespoke blocks or or putting putting parts in to help pre-shape the block to reduce the amount of milling but we didn't really take that forward because they had a production line in relation to sort of manufacturing. You know, we were using their their production line. They've only got one production line in the factory. So for them to do a lot of fiddly stuff with us would have meant they had to shut down production, which wasn't really feasible in this research. Yeah? So we were working more with a standard maximum block size and then doing all the fiddling around at the Bartlett with the robotics where we had the space and time to do it. Okay. Um, and then the other question is, well, it goes back to your initial, what you, what you just explained. So you still had to check, although the blocks seem to be very different in, uh, in their qualities uh, because of the size of the grain. How do you go about the mechanical properties of the cork blocks? Do you take the lower limit and you had extensive testing on 20 yeah. of them? Or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, Amarin produced a number of different uh grades of cork block um, and some of them are and that really mainly relates to how well sorted the granules are so for there's a standard insulation grade that is more agricultural and has more can have more bits of charred timber in and things um, and this one was the most uniform which is called md facade which is their facade grade cork um, so it was relatively uniform and on top of that um 
then there were in excess of about um, 20, I can't remember, 20 to 50 tests on just cubes of the material. And from memory, we selected the lightest and the heaviest block uh, as, as a part of that mix. So University of Bath did all the structural characterization work and then Arup used that. And, you know, the way that those walls go together and the fact that it that cork is compressible to an extent also, I think, helps to balance out that variation a bit. Because if one block's weaker and another's heavier, it naturally just slightly settles. Um, it's one of the characteristics of this form of construction, which means that it's pretty good on a single story, but perhaps not so good for multi-story, is there is a level of settlement over 12 months. Yeah, So it slowly squashes down and gets comfortable over, over about the first 12 months. Yeah. Do you have an idea of the, of the value of the mechanical characteristics, more or less? No, I'm afraid I don't. Um, I'm not so good with num structural numbers. Um, uh -huh. What I do remember is I think that the shrinkage was about one, uh, the, not shrinkage, creep. I think the creep was about 1%, yeah? Yeah, okay. So okay. In, a three, you know, in a three meter high room, you've got 30 millimeters to deal with. So we designed the window systems with quite a large gap at the top to allow for settlement and just used a compraband foam tape while well, that settlement happened to keep the weather out. And now it's kind of snugger fit, yeah. Yeah, that would be like the full timber houses with the lumber that you also have this kind of uh, creep and shrinkage, uh, of course, in time, and that you always have the big gaps around the, the windows. Yeah, that's um, right. And yeah, importance of like putting the roof finish on before you like put the windows in and that sort of stuff. I mean, Matthew and I are not an expert on this, but um, Pete Walker is, and also Andrew Lawrence is Arab's global global timber um, specialist and we were lucky that he was a, the lead structural engineer on the project mm -hmm. so really we didn't really talk about their involvement but it was absolutely critical because as architects it's easy to come up with a clever idea if you like but whether or not that's that's viable or uh, and what stops that from being happening or not is is completely down to a relationship uh, with engineers very much as as part of the design team yeah so they did, you know, Arab did a lot of detailed structural work on this small house and submitted a sort of 75 page report as a part of the, of the building control package to get uh, regulatory approval. Um, and that's kind of the nice thing about working on a small project that you can, you can do much more innovative work in a way um, than you could on a, on a much larger project for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Well, especially if it's a private project like this in the garden of someone that it's not it's yeah. not a public project where you need to get the regulations differently but what is yeah. essential here is your dialogue also with the engineers that they need to find a way of regulatory approval which means that they wrote the protocol of testing probably that's so. right in the uk the uk is quite interesting i think as i understand it it's not as code-based as perhaps places like germany i'm not sure about the arrangement in france and um there's more permissiveness, but I don't know how true that is because I never really get involved in the detail. But And engineers, are, anyway, are found ways to demonstrate that they met the necessary requirements in mm. structure and in fire. And in both cases, it was quite a major undertaking for this project, much in excess of the kind of apparently simple simple form. Yeah. Sure. Um, there's an interesting question also here from uh, Bastien, who's asking... Um, he's wondering at first whether there is enough cork production for an upscale of the use of cork in construction industry, since it can actually only be harvested every seven years. And then the other question he's asking uh, is if the material that has been cut out, can it be reassembled to a block with the same properties as the original one? Or is that only into a sort of downcycling? Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, in terms of in terms of the material, it's the same as any um, as any uh, plant based material. Obviously, there's a relationship between the scale of the harvest and the material. So there's a kind of supply and demand relationship. So um, I mean, there's quite a lot of this material produced just as a natural part of cork oak forestry, and so wine stopper demand is still strong. Because although you still get um, you get screw, screw tops and things in some in some uh, lower cost wines these days, 
there's a growing kind of premium market in, including in China and that sort of stuff. So I understand there's still a strong demand for wine stopper corks and that produces about, you know, 80% cork oak waste, cork, um, cork waste, which then is available for um, the manufacturing industry. Now, if the manufacturing industry demand increased significantly, then obviously there would be, there's a time delay to increase um how much cork's available, but there's quite a li- quite a lot available. I mean, the cork, this insulation was one of the main insulation boards in the first half of the 20th century. Yeah? It was it was extensive. This material's been extensively used in construction for for at least 100 years. Um, and obviously, demand can go down. D- demand can increase. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, what was the other? I'd forgotten about the. Oh, uh, was- oh yeah, the downcycling. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, a granular. The granulated cork in itself is quite an expensive material to buy. Um, I'm not. I don't think it would be suitable for making for recooking again. I'm not sure it would. But that type of cooked cork is used in a range of composite cork products um, by mixing polyurethane. It's used as a as a loose fill insulation. Le Corbusier used it ages back, and it's still used uh, for that purpose. And it's also got other uses such as um, uh, ground earth improver for certain types of soils in agriculture so yeah there are quite a lot of uses for it but i don't think you'd put it back in the autoclave and, and cook it again okay. uh, and then there was a question from myself actually how do you go around tolerance once you're on and trouble the possible trouble on site of course and maybe something that goes with it it's also specific to the construction site is how the surface and color develop over time, uh, especially with yeah. the weather. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, the, the, well, the surface the, the surface coloration is easy. You can see it's quite dark to start off with, but in the end, it silvers just like timber. Yeah, so it um, it goes light, uh, beautiful kind of silver color, just as untreated timber would. So they look end up looking very similar, and I guess it it ends up probably looking more like like stone like a limestone or uh, um, something like that as it weathers so it looks great yeah internally it stays dark for longer because um, you know because it doesn't get that level of sunlight of uv on it um, in terms of tolerance on the construction site yeah when I mean, obviously in theory it should all be beautiful and so things we found on the construction site were a couple of things in relation to that one was that because of the interference fit it was quite difficult it works it works in section, things go on top of each other and there's weight and they squash down. In plan, when you're building a wall that's like 10 meters long, the interference fit means they just don't want to sit snugly together. And they wanted to, it wanted to grow. So we ended up making timber profiles and using ratchet straps as they use in transport to just squeeze the whole thing together until we got to the ring beam at the top of the wall, which is like it locks the jigsaw puzzle together. And when that's in, it can't go anywhere. And then, and the pyramids are more self-regulating. Now we did have some issues with tolerance on some of the blocks. Some types came into sight, you know, two millimeters taller than they should, that sort of thing. And what we did then was, um, you know, it's quite easy material to work with. So we tried to squeeze, we squeezed some of them in. <laughs> um, others, we just got a handsaw out, yeah? I mean, it's a pretty, if it's like the wrong size, it's pretty easy to just take a little bit off. I think luckily the blocks that were the wrong size were slightly over. We didn't get any small ones. So you literally just oh, just get the handsaw out and chop it. It's an incredibly easy material to work with. Yeah, chisel, the, chisel away. Yeah, uh... Chisel away, exactly. We just thought, oh no, come on, you know. So yeah, it wasn't the CNC aspect wasn't quite as perfect as we were hoping for. But, um, but you know, we it really did lower the barriers to enabling this project. If you'd had to hand make each one of those blocks, it would have been crazy. And the robotics in the Bartlett was, you know, ro- industrial robots are really cheap for what they can do. So that incredible functionality for a low cost and a relatively small footprint. So they were a very effective research tool. And then when we wanted to make a lot, the five axis CNC machine was great. And Bob Doodle were fantastic in really sticking with it and actually making all those blocks because it was quite a challenging project for them to take on and they didn't um, they didn't give up. So not every block was perfect, but overall it was pretty amazing for a first effort, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah, maybe for the public to know, you talked about the BMate, and that's the fab lab somehow, the fabrication lab from the in-house at the Bartlett, of course, which is, if you're ever in London, for those that haven't been there, uh, I do really invite you to go and see it. There's Gordon Street, but there's also the Formula Olympic site there with the Bartlett. We have, of course, an enormous, res enormous resources here, so it's pretty, pretty interesting. And maybe yeah, yeah, really good. But also, I mean, amazing people too. I mean, this is very yeah. much kind of developed by Bob Shearer, who's the current head of school. And the kit's great, but it, but also the, the people are really remarkable because they have the expertise, but they're very interested in research-based methods. And so they're really, really invaluable people to work with. Yeah. That's very good that you say that because it's yeah. true. You go there with a project and actually you do have uh timber specialists in a certain way or you have other specialists there in, at the b-mate that actually yeah. do know how things are made and they do make you aware of certain details where you should try to redesign it maybe and so before yeah, the yeah machine, no they're great yeah they're before brilliant. the machine comes yeah. there's already a, a big discussion so i mean you're constantly yeah. in touch with makers and i think this is a specific approach to teaching which bob indeed yeah. bob shield the yeah. head of, of school there introduced 20 years ago maybe uh, yeah. or even earlier where he was already mm. looking for the budget. And it has been yeah. a driver in some of the innovative stuff that the Bartlett's uh, could do. So I think here in Versailles, we have, we're have trying to build up a similar approach with building the Fab Lab, of course, too. But we're not as far in the robotics because that's typically a problem. I think that if everybody, there's only so, ma only so many robots that you can let turn at the same time. And if it's then standing idle for too much of the time also, so rather start with maybe low, te low tech things and just making learning by making yeah absolutely yeah absolutely. absolutely i mean the robots are, i mean robots are just pretty fiddly really i mean we use these for a very specific reason because we had a large block size and we needed a five axes type machine and the only thing we had had available at the bartler was an industrial robot to do it but yeah no absolutely it's not there's nothing magic about industrial robots really i think hand making by hand and then maybe some introductory use of cnc is um can get you just about anywhere i think really yeah, yeah. there's some other questions if you still have the time i mean yeah absolutely go for it yeah it's nice it's uh nice somebody says thank you very much for the answer and the lecture beautiful building so that's also nice to say of course so <laughs> nice to know. And then um from frank um he's asking if it'd be possible to have some basic block shapes already when cooking i think you talked briefly about it because when you cook the yeah. pork, so in order to reduce the waste um yeah absolutely yeah it is interesting i mean um it uh we thought about that too and issues around that are on this project we couldn't mess around with amarim's production line because that was where they were making all the court blocks in that factory so it would have been hugely disruptive um it would be nice to try that i think the issue would be that you might get massively varying block density it's actually quite a complicated cooking process that the block goes through they have to take care that areas don't get burnt and they have to take care that all the areas get cooked enough and try to keep the density uniform and it cooks as a block and comes out and then needles are inserted deep in that squirt water through the whole block to stop it carrying on cooking inside um so i think yeah you could you could put some parts in which which could help um it's a very rough block when it comes out so you'd still need to still need to see and see to get accurate shapes uh, we're mm -hmm. doing a project at the moment, actually, where we're just leaving the exposed walls uh, in the cooked, cooked, um, cooked cork and just cutting where you need accurate fit. So that's quite fun to try that. Um, also, there was interest from mass house builders and things on this project. And something they were interested in uh, was trying to make a larger single cork wall panel, which could be maybe two by two meters, but still just 300 thick. And I think that would be possible on a large enough autoclave but then obviously the issue is that it's not a simple system that you can just pick up a block and and put one on top of the other but it would really be beneficial to reduce the amount of joints in the system because that's really a weakness yeah um yeah. yeah no i think what is especially fantastic here is that it doesn't come just from nowhere they already tested something back in the days and i wasn't aware that it was already such a construction material at some point so even if you see yeah the this that's right it's it become somehow... a bit unknown a lot of people when they see the work think we invented the the block 
but it's been it's got a long history um um really quite interesting and then it got partly displaced but it's still kind of there and ready to go i mean we should do it in france i mean we drink enough wine so i mean it should be possible to do something it's, um, yeah you've got some cork you've got some cork oak trees in france yeah I mean, too. just not so ready yeah you should just drink a bit more and then get all the corks together and then yeah because that, i think that's the question that bastian actually had it's like how much do you need to drink and how many corks can you reuse, <laughs> can you reuse the corks actually to build yeah a that's a simple cork. question i think if you want to take that approach you'd drink a lot and then you could build your mausoleum out of the cork <laughs> you'd have to drink so much you'd be you'd probably be pickled like a mummy and then you'd last for thousands of years and you could build the small <laughs> too much wide um, yeah the dog's house like the first one we built yeah <laughs> And then there's a question from Kathy about um, if you know the core performance in respect of the carbon sink properties. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I didn't show in this lecture, but we've got we did we involved a, a consultant to do a detailed whole life carbon analysis on the project, and um, and the method that they use counts the the carbon, the atmospheric carbon locked into the material. So obviously, as, as, as the tree grows, it absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere, locks it into the fabric. Um, and because of that, the cork house was carbon negative at completion because it had about 16, 16 tons of uh, sequestered carbon in the, in the material. And then there was less carbon emissions through transporting it. And, and so it was just slightly under zero carbon at completion. And then that obviously carbon emissions start to accrue over the life um so yeah it's very low carbon i mean that whole thing about counting embodied um counting sequestered carbon is interesting and some methods count that and some don't but i think in cork's case yeah it's quite a positive way to lock atmospheric carbon into building materials because you're stripping the cork uh that locks in atmospheric carbon for as long as that material is still exists and also you're not having to cut cut trees down which is another positive so obviously normally in timber, yeah, you've, you've got about, you know, it's looking in about its own weight of CO2, atmospheric CO2. But at the same time, when you cut a, when you cut a tree down to get timber, about half of the tree is left in the ground and that then rots and, and emits carbon emissions. So the story is slightly more complex with timber. But I think with cork, it's a really positive story that you really are just locking in atmospheric carbon uh, and not putting out emissions through the other half of the plant that's dying. And, and, and another really good thing about the cork is that it helps to sustain these these really biodiverse landscapes, yeah? which a lot of current um, forestry practices don't do. They're very monocultural. So it's an interesting aspect. Yeah, I think, I mean... I, think, I, I guess there's even lots of questions and it would have been nice to have you in a room where we can actually continue debating. I mean, yeah. maybe we can do that some sometime in the future. It'd be really nice. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we have a nice place in Versailles, you know, we're just, yeah. we're, the building is part of the Chateau de Versailles somehow. So oh, fantastic. It's... Yeah. That'd be lovely. I'd welcome a chance. Yeah. I've been, I went to Versailles when I was a kid. I was very impressed. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's still, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. So I think, yeah. Thanks a lot. It's really an unbelievable collaboration between the university and the private uh, partnership also, which I think is really rare, especially yeah. in, in other countries like in France and all this. So we don't really have it. And I believe mm. it's coming from the architectural part and not just engineering university, which is also very nice. But then I think also the fact to make things uh, scale one to one, again, testing, going back to the drawing board. I think there it's, it's really interesting. And what is for me, especially, we had a lot of discussions this week in the other lectures, is like how to encompass the regulations that are in place and how to mm -hmm. work around them. And here, here you see it's going through University of Bath, it's working at the yeah. UCL, working with engineers. So there's a lot of energy there involved, but somehow you got it done. So it's, I mean, it really makes one believe, okay, we can still do change all these things and go a bit further and, and open up some, some new ways of building and thinking and in a way it's not new thinking which mm -hmm. i also think is very important to at least students but also in mm -hmm. general the the conceivers of or the people that conceive new buildings is we're all pulling our 
are, are we're building on the, on the history in a certain way. This palimpsest that exists, the technologies that were used for the last couple of thousand years, are not, they're not over. People just yeah. did invent some quite interesting parts. And with the modern techniques that you had to use somehow, or you could use, you had the ability to use them. So you'd reinterpret somehow ancient techniques. And I think that's quite... It's quite beautiful, honestly. It's... Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that's th thanks very much. Yeah, it was great. It was really, it was a lot of fun. And it does, it feels like there's a lot of potential in that general area and that sort of approach. Understanding now that some historic approaches have got renewed relevance to us now because we want different things from our buildings than, than we did last century. Uh, you can learn a lot from those historic, you know, I think that's very exciting, that mix of historical approaches. What do we want to do now? Uh, let's have fun with the new tools that we've got available. Um, yeah. Let's uh, do 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 give us a call if you want to do one in France. Actually, I wouldn't be. I would be nice. Oh, thanks. Well, it'd be lovely to. Yeah. Let's. Well, I think things are really coming down again. So maybe sometime next academic year or something, we'll have to catch up sometime and make a plan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it'd be great. great. It'd be lovely to get out of the country. You know, yeah. we've been stuck here for so long now. <laughs> get over to Europe. Yeah. Okay, thank you so Great. much, Oliver. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Have a nice man. weekend. Thanks for the session. Thanks for the speech. Super. Thanks, and, guys. Uh, see you soon again then. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for all the interest. That was great. Bye then. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks to the public too for being here. Thanks for the questions. Take care, everybody. Keep safe. Keep healthy. Bye.